Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Matt O'Lean. On this edition of Prairie Mosaic, we'll meet a knife maker from Pelican Rapids, Minnesota, learn more about Theodore Roosevelt, see an excerpt from Prairie Public's documentary, Women Behind the Plow, and hear a selection from another Prairie Public documentary, More Than Just the Music. Artist and professor Zimmy Guan has been exposed to art since his childhood. His balance of traditional and abstract art has taken many forms and has been exhibited throughout the United States and China. People deserve art and we need to create that art for the people. I want to be a people's artist. <laughs> I want everybody to have one of my painting. I'm Zimmy Guan, Z-H-I-M-I-N-G-U-A-N, and I'm from Anhui, China, which is in the middle of China, somewhere between Beijing and Shanghai. My father is a retired art teacher, and my mother is an art store owner, and they both are really passionate about art. My father really influenced me on his perfection. If you're working as an artist, you have to almost always make no flaws, and your work has to be very, very strong. I studied in a Chinese university. My training in the classical art is solid because they really emphasize on drawing, on some basic proportions, anatomy, and color theory. I start to feel like the creative part is not only using one medium. Your creative part is actually starting from how do you manage your materials. I will use watercolor, acrylic, sometimes oil. I combine all of this medium. I'm more figurative painter. I like a portrait and a figure because they are traditionally really high level of technical requirements. They are very challenging and you feel high level of accomplishment if you can finish that. I was interested in landscape because I felt that nature has a, such a power and color every day. I start to be really interested in if I can capture that. Recently, I went to the Zion National Park and Grand Canyon. I really start to look at American national parks. So I developed a national park series of abstract painting. So my work in that series is trying to remind people there is a great, beautiful nature world out there waiting us to go to see. I spent a few years to really try to experiment with abstract painting. And I started to bring all my knowledge of color theory, composition, calligraphy together to create my own style of abstraction. Art almost become a meditation to me. When I start to be in front of a wide canvas, I almost feel I'm facing a battle because it's very challenging. If you want to create a totally unreal world with a solid figures or still life or landscapes, you almost have to really forgetting everything in your life. You have to always totally whole mindedly into concentration. And you not necessarily winning the battle, but still you are trying to express the best knowledge of yourself. I'm a professor of art in Minnesota State University, Moorhead, for almost 22 years. So today I want to show you um, how to work with all your painting on landscape. My painting process I started working on tackle the problems, tackle the possible, seeable problems. I really enjoy teach introduction to painting because most students didn't have any training 
in handling their materials and techniques. So it's really like, I think your brushes really just leave some paint on it. You don't want to like do, you know, like that. That's a bit too strong. I feel it's really refreshing for me to tell them what to do and how to improve their work, how to observe, how to really use medium, how to come up with composition that can put together their projects. I feel benefited from teaching. I love teaching. <laughs> I'm so lucky. I'm into a very active artistic community. The Fargo-Moorhead Visual Artist Organization is very active in organizing art crawl every year. Feel free to walk in and uh, look at art. Have some critique too. That always make artists excited to display their work at the same time attract the local community to look at how they create. The Rock Art Museum has almost become a local treasure. Not only have very high level collection, but also at the same time, the directors really discover the new emerging artist and give the emerging artist a one-man show to promote the artist I feel I know more audience because of the Rock Art Museum. My friends and colleagues and brothers and parents, they are really proud of me to study in America and working as a professor in America. That's a big deal for them. And also at the same time, they feel that I should really shooting for my own goal, for my passion, and really support me to continue to develop my artistic style. You should continue trying to carry on your dream. I'm lucky to live in this country, open, melting pot, welcome all new styles. I can be wholeheartedly involved in teaching and creating art, and I feel I have a very happy career and life. Tim Pierce of Pelican Rapids, Minnesota has always loved working with his hands. He found his passion making knives from a variety of materials including wood, animal bones, and obsidian. They're a thing of beauty, but they're also a tool. My wife took a job in Japan, and I needed a new hobby. Being I was working with rocks a whole bunch, I started looking at doing some flint napping. I use obsidian, which is volcanic glass. It's got different colors in it, depending upon what was in the sand. If it had iron in it, it's red. If it's got copper in it, it's green. Some of it is quite clear, almost light glass. Some of it's so black you can't see through it. I slab it into three-eighths thick slab and then cut it down a little bit more so I can draw out a knife pattern on it. And then I grind it into the knife pattern. The blade would have a lens type shape to it. So it's thicker in the middle and skinnier on the edges. Once you get to that point, then you switch to a stick with a copper point on it and press down on the top edge of this thing and snap off a flute of obsidian. It's a lot of fun. My old dentist, Phil Hagen, he is extremely well known in the knife making business. I was showing him the pieces that I was doing and he told me to come over to his shop one day and he showed me around and he told me to come over here anytime I want and start working with metal. And 17 years later, I just bought out all his equipment and moved it into my shop, and here I am. There's lots of different kinds of steel. You can't use mild steel. You got to use like a, a spring steel or good grade of stainless steel. You cut out a pattern and you semi-grind it out. Take away the big stuff so that you're not grinding on the hard metal a whole bunch. 
then you have to heat treat it to get the temper in it so that it remains a hard knife and will hold a decent edge on it. My forge was built by my mentor. It's a barrel 316 steel with insulation, one inch thick. It's propane operated. It goes from whatever the ambient temperature of the room is up to 2,000 degrees in less than five minutes. After you heat treat it and you finish grinding it, put a handle on it, buff it out, and sharpen it. I make what they call fixed blade knives, you know, like your kitchen knives, hunting knives, folding knives. Slip joints are pretty technical. I've made an automatic knife. Every knife I've built has pretty much been a one-of-a-kind type knife. I make some pieces that wind up to be mantle pieces. They buy them as an art piece, not as a useful piece. I really like making the stuff that somebody's going to use or carry. Hunting knife, kitchen knife, it's a nice looking piece, but it was also something that should be used. It is a big part of the, of the process to figure out what size handle you need on what size knife and for whom it is going to. I usually shake their hand to see how big their hand is because if I make any type of knife and it doesn't fit them, it's a bad fit. You have to have a balance in it as far as the size of the handle compared to the size of the guy compared to the size of the knife. You can't make a buoy knife with a three inch handle on it. A buoy knife is like 10 inches long. Women hands are much smaller for the most part than what a man's hand is. So the handle has to be smaller round. It needs to be a little shorter, even if the knife blade is the same size. There's all kinds of wild and crazy things out there that you can use for knife handles. Antler, horn, stone, rock, certain types of plastic, mammoth tooth, mammoth ivory, quite exotic bone from giraffes, camel, whale. I like the wood. It goes back to my woodworking background. Being we were in the logging business and sawmilling business, we had lots of lumber to work with, so I really like the different types of woods. They're very unique. I like going out and finding the things that I use to me, that's all part of it. The more that I can do for making my knives, the better the process is for me. I made a knife for my dad out of chainsaw chain, and uh, it's got a red oak burl handle on it. And it's off of the last logging job that he did, and my brother and I did with him. The chainsaw chain is out of that, and the burl's off of that last logging job. On special knives like that, it means more to me. I have more of myself into it. The reward isn't in the paycheck. It's in how they like it and what they're going to do with it. I'm hoping to retire and stand out here and make knives. That's my long-term goal is just to have the enjoyment of making knives. I would really like to pass that on to somebody like my mentor did for me. I wouldn't be doing this if he wouldn't have saw something in me that said I could do this. This is my sanctuary. I spend a lot of time out here evenings, weekends, when construction is down. I'll come out here and work all day, 10, 12 hours a day. I get lost in it. I'm proud of what I do. I like the challenge of it. It makes me feel pleased. I'll put it that way. I'm pleased with what I do. Theodore Roosevelt was a hunter, but he also held the belief that animals needed to be protected. He did this with the creation of bird reservations, national game preserves, national forests, and national parks. Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, featuring the words of Roosevelt as read by Steve Stark. Theodore Roosevelt created the first national park in North Dakota, one of five national parks added by Roosevelt. The relatively small 780 wooded acres near Devil's Lake suffered a rough start in size, funding, and management. In 1931, the national park designation was rescinded, the park becoming a game refuge under the aegis of the National Wildlife Refuge System. 
Today, Sully's Hill National Game Preserve has expanded to over 1,600 acres of prairie and woodland as a fascinating and picturesque home to a controlled number of bison and elk, a large herd of roaming deer, and a steady, impressive array of migratory birds. Those daring to make the steep climb up the actual Sully's Hill are treated to one of the state's remarkable views of a memorable nature preserve that Theodore Roosevelt believed in with his every fiber. It will be a real misfortune if our wild animals disappear from mountain, plain, and forest to be found only in game preserves. It is to the interest of all of us to see that there is ample and real protection for our game as for our woodlands. A true democracy really alive to its opportunities will insist upon such game preservation, for it is to the interest of our people as a whole. Conservation and rural life policies are really two sides to the same policy, and at bottom lies the fundamental law that neither man nor nature can prosper unless, in dealing with the present, thought is steadily given to the future. Today, women face many obstacles if they want to pursue a career in agriculture. Carol and Carly Just talk about these obstacles and their role models in this excerpt from Prairie Public's documentary, Women Behind the Plow. Growing up on a farm, living an agrarian life, there were some strong women in my life. My Aunt Lydia lived next door. I don't think there was a piece of machinery she didn't like. She was good at everything in the house and out. Good with the animals. I was always so interested to see how much she seemed to enjoy farm life. My Aunt Elaine, I don't believe she slept. She worked from morning till night, had five sons and a daughter, but she could milk those cows, come in, make breakfast, go back out, work in the yard, come in, make lunch, and then she would go back out. This was, it seemed all summer long. She was amazing. My observation is that opportunities for women or young girls on the farm are there provided there's availability of land. In our family, we have the gift that my nephew is the third generation running that farm. So if his daughters or his son choose to farm, at least they likely would have a farm to do it. So let me tell you about my great niece, Carly. She lives on the farm I grew up on and loves her animals, loves her goat, loves horses, but loves her roosters and chickens has started a little cottage industry for those who want free-range eggs. And she and her dad built a couple of little different chicken coops. And I am so happy to see this full circle happen. On our farm, we grow crops and cattle. I have roughly around 25 chickens, and we have two coops, and they just kind of do their own thing, come in, Throughout the day, lay their eggs. They are free range, so they get the whole farm to wander around. And we get about, I wanna say around two dozen eggs a day. At school, I sell the eggs to the teachers. They buy a lot of them, and then just community members, family, everybody just buys eggs for me, it seems like. My mom was in 4-H, my grandma was in 4-H. Now I'm in 4-H, it's kind of a family thing. I absolutely love it. It's shaped me as the person I am today because of all the leadership skills I've learned. And nowadays it is not just all agriculture. You can do sewing, cooking, you can do just about anything in 4-H. There's definitely some males in my class that think that farming isn't meant for a woman. So I have faced a lot of that because they claim that women aren't strong enough and women don't know enough about agriculture. Nowadays, anybody can become a farmer. And I especially have it good because my dad's a farmer and he is cool with me farming and everything. For three generations, it's only been males farming, so I'd kind of like to be 
the first female to become the fourth generation. It's really hard to become a farmer because you don't have a set salary. That's why it scares a lot of people away from agriculture because if there's one bad storm, it could wipe out your whole farm and you could be broke. If a woman came up to me saying that they were interested in agriculture, I would definitely tell them that anything is possible because in this world today, women can do anything and they can do it just as well as a man. The Lincoln High School Concert Choir, led by Darcy Reese, is the subject of Prairie Public's documentary, More Than Just the Music. Enjoy an inspiring song written by Darnell Davis titled, Let's Come Together. have been broken, humanity needs a strong foundation, and we must build it together.
If you know of an artist, topic, or organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at prairiemosaic at prairiepublic.org. You can watch this and other episodes of Prairie Mosaic on Prairie Public's YouTube channel. And please follow Prairie Public on social media as well. I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Matt Olean. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.